Um, Jala Dane Honashi, um, Tashke Miyamiaki, Shidu Jerome Viles, um, Che Met Dane Nashli, Saletsi Nashli, Chinook Hichu Nashli, Kalapuya Dan Sasta, um, Miyamiongi Dan Sasta Jishres, Hiwan Shishrekhan. So, hello, people, um, chiefs, leaders, the Miami people. Um, I'm Jerome Viles. I come from people living in the village called Che Met at the mouth of the Rogue River in southwestern Oregon. I'm enrolled at the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. Uh, my family is also Chinook Indian from the mouth of the Columbia River. I live in Kalapuya territory today with my family in Eugene, Oregon, and I'm happy to be in the homelands of the Miami people today. For the past decade, I've worked in various capacities to help my people and our related tribes in revitalization of our languages. This led me to pursue a career in linguistics, specifically focused on working with archival materials. Much like the revitalization of the Miami language, um, my heritage language of Nuea or Oregon Dene is occurring largely without first language speakers. Um, so the written and audio materials that our elders left us are critically important. I now serve at the Miyamiya Center as a National Breath of Life Archives Development Trainer. But before that, I worked as a member of a project at the Northwest Indian Language Institute to build an archive, um, a digital archive of my language. And through that project, we piloted the broader release of the MIDA software developed by the Miami Tribe and the Miyamiya Center that has evolved into what we call ILDA today. Um, I'm here with, as Daryl said, our National Breath of Life co-director, and I'm going to turn it over to her now to introduce herself and get the presentation started. I'm not that tall. <laughs> Shashila um, Mishinewe. Let me. Um, ah, yeah. Um, my name is Gabriela Perez Vaz, as you heard. Um, and you'll notice that my name has a lot of, um, a couple of accent marks. I'm from Mexico, born and raised. And you might wonder what I'm, I'm doing here. Um, I became a linguist after an attempt at becoming a graphic designer. I became a linguist uh, because I wanted to contribute to the sustainability of indigenous languages back home in Mexico. Uh, and so that's what I did during my dissertation work, my doctoral work, and eventually I got a job as the curator of linguistics at the Smithsonian Institution, and I discovered uh, the amounts uh, of archival materials of Native American languages. Um, held at repositories like the one at the National Anthropological Archives uh, that I was in charge uh, of. But I, most importantly, I discovered what had been happening and what was happening with Native American languages, both from the language endangerment point of view, but more importantly, the language revitalization point of view. And I began working since 2010 in National Breath of Life. So let me walk you through uh, what that... Uh, path has been so that I can tell you what we've been working on since then. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that this material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, we have received substantial support uh, from the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, uh, the Miami Center, of course, the Miami University, the Smithsonian Institution's uh, Recovering Voices, the University of Oregon, which is the institution where I am now, uh, and additional in-kind support from the National Anthropological Archives, the uh, National Museum of the American Indian, um, and the Library of Congress. Um, so the point of departure is the language endangerment situation. Uh, it's very difficult to um, count languages, and it's very difficult to assess the vitality at which they are. But a couple of sources seem to be a little bit consistent, so I took those numbers just to give us a sense of the extent of endangerment and therefore revitalization efforts. Um, according to a publication, Simons and Lewis, 2013, um, there are 18 Native American languages in North America, so counting the US and Canada, um, that are in vigorous use. 
Um, there are 85 or so languages that are endangered at various degrees. Uh, and there's 163 or thereabouts uh, languages that at some point in their history reached the point of dormancy, meaning the a point in which they did not have um, first language speakers. Um, and of course, then languages such as uh, Miamia, um, with active revitalization efforts after this period of dormancy, are what we refer to as awakening languages. So all our efforts are, um, all the efforts of the National Breath of Life are in support of awakening languages. Oh. Mishinewe, for everyone's patience. I guess I should uh, get back to this in earnest. So then I was, as I was saying, um, so there's this concept of awakening languages, which is central to the work of um, National Breath of Life. Um, and it's rather a growing mo uh, movement at this point. Um, so with a couple of other colleagues, I ran a survey of language revitalization efforts worldwide uh, a few years ago. And out of 245 efforts that we documented, one in five was an effort to uh, revitalize a language that had been dormant at some point. Um, in North America, we know that there are more dormant languages that have an active revival effort than languages, dormant languages that do not. And about half the awakening languages in the world are in North America. Um, a critical resource for these efforts are uh, archival language resources. Uh, languages have been documented uh, throughout history by community members, by missionaries, uh, by government entities like the Bureau of American Ethnology, and by academics of various sorts, anthropologists, linguists, and so on. Um, and so the mission of the National Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages is to work with these uh, awakening language communities to build capacity around methods um, in archive-based research for community-directed revitalization uh, efforts in these awakening language contexts. Um, since 2011, when National Breath of Life held its first um, workshop, we have provided training uh, to 137 Native American community researchers from 65, um, working on 65 different languages. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of the history. Um, in 1993, there was a workshop at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, and uh, out of this workshop emerged a publication called Paper and Talk. Um, also in the, min in, in the same decade, in 96, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival developed a training workshop to support uh, the revitalization of native dormant languages, specifically in California. This was the Breath of Life Archival Institute for California Indigenous Languages, and they were working with community members representing about 30 languages at the time. And since then, they have held biannual workshops at, uh, that access materials at the Bancroft Library, uh, the Phoebe Apperson um, Hearst Museum of Anthropology and the Survey of California and other Indian languages. Uh, there have been other regional uh, workshops, a couple at the University of Washington, I believe three at the University of Oklahoma, Norman, and one at the University of British Columbia uh, in Canada. So as I mentioned earlier, the National Breath of Life uh, started in 2011, or that was the first workshop. Uh, and this was the first uh, workshop of national scope. Um, we um, benefited from the vision and logistical contributions from, the, uh, from ICOS, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. Um, the first two workshops, 2011 and 13, were organized by the Endangered Language Fund through Lisa Conathan and Doug Whalen and supported uh, by the National Science Foundation. Um, at that time, um, we were offering two-week workshops focused on the importance of gathering archival language materials for revitalizations, uh, uh, revitalization out of the um, DC repositories. Um, the, the workshops were co-hosted by the National Museum of Natural History and the National Museum of the American Indian, both of which uh, are at the Smithsonian Institution, and also by the Library of Congress. So at that point, that's when I was already working at the National Museum of Natural History. 
Um, the workshops, in addition to providing guidance and access to the archival materials, offered introductory courses in linguistics uh, with the purpose of uh, showing the participants what linguistics could do to advance their efforts, and also workshops and or um, lectures on revitalization strategies that focused on the use of those archival materials. So uh, we offered biennial workshops uh, in 2011, 13, 15, and 17. And as Daryl said, in 2014, that's when the Miamia Center becomes the institutional home of the National Breath of Life, and Daryl and I teamed up to co-direct the institute. So since then, um, we have worked, uh, well, through these introductory workshops, we have offered training to community researchers from all of these languages. There are, all, there are over 50 languages on this list, and you can see the, uh, the um, distribution. They're all across um, North America. Um, now, over time, of course, we started to identify certain needs, especially with regards to greater access to trainer, uh, training um, and program assessment and evaluation. So um, whenever we held a workshop, we would receive over 100 applications, and we could only accept about 20 to 25 applicants. Um, so at present, we are currently uh, we're working to increase access to training. Um, we are developing a self-directed training program, which will be offered free of charge on a learning management system, online, asynchronous, now that we're used to all of that stuff, um, full of multimedia, um, so that um, uh, community researchers can access this training at any time uh, from their home and not having to leave their home for two weeks to get the training. Uh, this is work that is being supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, we also were prompted by and funded by the National Science Foundation to carry out a third-party program assessment and evaluation. Uh, the work was directed by Kristen Morio um, at Miami University's Discovery Center for Evaluation, Research, and Professional Learning. Uh, the assessment focused on the 2017 workshop. Um, the team carried out a pre-workshop and a post-workshop -quest questionnaire, as well as a longitudinal impact assessment, uh, talking to alumni from the four workshops. Um, and this is what we learned. So one of the questions, or many of the questions sent, uh, in the questionnaire centered on the goals that the revitalization practitioners, community researchers were bringing in when they started the uh, uh, workshop in 2017. And as you can see on the left side of your screen, uh, hopefully, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a great interest in locating and discovering those archival materials that will support the revitalization efforts. Um, and an even greater interest in learning how to analyze those materials to derive enough information about the language to implement that into their revitalization efforts. Now, two, after the workshop, after the two weeks, what we see is that the needs to know how to find those materials um, come down in frequency in these uh, questionnaires uh, because now the participants feel confident that at any time they can go back and find the materials themselves. Um, there's still an interest in learning more about how to analyze these materials, but then there's a ballooning interest in creating uh, tools that will make these materials accessible more broadly in the community. There's an interest in sharing and in increasing the impact of these materials and in planning collaboration uh, within the community to use these materials for revitalization. So with this um, information in mind, we started to conceptualize a longer term vision for the type of training that we could offer um, to awakening language communities. So we were fairly comfortable uh, in knowing that um, we were guiding effectively uh, the participants through a process of gathering materials. And here we're using the metaphor of basket weaving, right? So the um, workshops that, I, that I've been talking about were about gathering those materials that would be used for the weaving process. Um, 
But sometimes, and luckily, um, these materials would be really copious. So I remember being at the uh, archives one day with a group of community researchers who had about 80 boxes of about 2,000 pages each uh, on their language, and they arrived equipped with notebooks and pencils. And that was a key moment for me to realize, well, um, there needs to be um, tools that will support the organization of these materials, the processing of the materials, especially since the processing is very iterative. So maybe you go through a page, you discover certain things, you go back to that page, you discover new things, you need to code that information in alongside that original archival page so you can keep track of it and build upon that analysis over years, right? Um, so that's when we started thinking about what to, how to process uh, these materials. Um, moving forward, um, our path will hopefully take us to thinking more about how to weave all of this work into the revitalization uh, activities. And perhaps here I just want to clarify that this is a, a model of philology, Native American philology, not necessarily a model for uh, revitalization. Uh, we understand, we're very keenly aware of the fact that each community goes into revitalization at different paces in different ways. Um, the process of gathering and processing and weaving happen alongside each other, simultaneously overlapping. This is just a way in which we conceptualize the training uh, that we can offer. Um, so we're squarely at the module two processing stage, which is what uh, Jerome will talk to you about. Okay. Um, thank you, Gabriela. I just, yeah, wanted to add, um, I really like this weaving metaphor. I come from um, basket weaving people, as I know Miami people are, and I think most of us across the continent are. But um, another way I like to think and talk about this model is in thinking about um, layers of accessibility, or rather inaccessibility. And that's re what really got me into work with my community was um, the desire to repatriate our archival materials, our cultural and language information back to the community. So the first layer of inaccessibility and what really is being addressed in module one is just uh, physical access. Um, the writings and recordings of Indian languages that were gathered through the history of the US like Gabriela talked about, have historically been locked up at archival institutions or universities and largely inaccessible to the communities and people they come from. So in module one, or those workshops Gabriella was talking about, by bringing these native language workers, um, like myself and my brother in that picture, um, we brought them to the archives to see, handle, take pictures of, get digital copies of these archival materials. National Breath of Life was really addressing that physical inaccessibility, but, um, what comes next? What comes after you have physical or digital access? Um, that's just the first step in peeling back these layers of inaccessibility so that the materials and the important information in them can be brought back to communities or repatriated to our communities. So say I have, and this is largely what happened to me and my group, um, say I have 10,000 pages of written materials, digital copies of written materials in PDF form. A lot of it's wordless, partially translated stories, verb tables, 200 or so hours of audio recordings of speakers telling stories or um, going over things with a linguist. But what we really need right now is to tell folks at our tribe how to start having a conversation or talking about things in their home. So how do I search through all that material um, to find what we need to build language programming to support revitalization in our community. And then once I've found it, how do I share it? Um, and how do I find it again? Um, I, everyone I've talked to who does this type of work has these moments. I, kn I know I saw that in this PDF, but I don't know exactly. And then you spend hours flipping through page by page by PDFs or listening to an hour long audio for the one word that you know is in there. <laughs> On top of that, many, if not most, or all of those archival writings are in alphabets that aren't in use by communities today. And I know the Miami people are very familiar with that. Um, so each person who wrote languages down 
had a different ear for the sounds and thus different accuracy when they were writing it down. And they were also all using their own individual alphabets. So even when I do find the words that I need, I might not have any idea how to interpret them or pronounce them. So that, there's that physical inaccessibility, but these things um, I like to talk about largely as organizational and intellectual inaccessibility. And it's really what we realize with our, in our model, we need to be addressing um, for these communities to continue working with them and supporting their work. And it's where we're developing programming now. So building on the assessment work of the Discovery Center, uh, the su success and experience of the Miamia Center and Miami Tribe, as well as our whole team's experiences in language revitalization and archival work, we designed a module two workshop with the goal of training community researchers to increase the accessibility, organizational and intellectual accessibility of their archival materials, first by typing them up and then by storing them in our indigenous languages digital archive or ILDA software, which makes them searchable and accessible to language researchers who are developing materials for revitalization in communities. We also designed this workshop to introduce communities to the ILDA dictionary platform, which serves as a pathway to disseminate the language and cultural information from the archive to the community at large. We've held two of our module two workshops. The first was here at Miami University in 2019, and the second was at the Northwest Indian Language Institute at the University of Oregon in 2021. Each workshop was a week long and brought five community research teams to the respective campuses to work with us. In total, we hosted um, 10 communities from across the country. Most were alumni of previous Breath of Life workshops, uh, National Breath of Life workshops in Washington, DC. And we're having that experience I was talking about of being overwhelmed by the sheer amount of archival data on their languages, and we're in need of processes, training, and tools to help organize their work moving forward. The tribes we worked with at these workshops have a wide variety of experiences and were in very different places in their archival language revitalization. Some are small, unrecognized tribes. Others um, represent large language departments at federally recognized tribal nations. Some are relying entirely on archival materials for language revitalization as they no longer have first language speakers and others are working to create archival databases to store their ongoing documentation efforts from their fluent speakers that they have today. But what really ties all these communities together is a commitment to language revitalization and also that they see immense value in creating and maintaining digital archives and dictionaries to help their efforts. So at our module two workshops, we trained our participants how to organize and create community curated archives using our ILDA software. They received training in both the archive side and the online dictionary. They also received training in how to perform the background processes necessary to populate an archive, such as transcribing written and audio archival materials using a variety of technical computer processes and software that will allow them to easily import data into ILDA. Another important component we try to always include our, in our work is to engage with communities around the need for solid, short, mid, and long-term project planning to guide their work. So participants also receive basic training in research planning. One aspect of our workshops that I think is really important to note and spans not just these module two workshops, but also the ones in Washington DC, is that our participants always emphasize the importance of the opportunity to network and be in community with other native people who are doing language revitalization. The sharing of cultures, experiences, and um, the emotional weight of language work um, brings our participants together and creates lasting relationships and uh, collaborations that yeah, span a, a long periods of time. Um, it makes me remember that one of the effects of colonization on our peoples is to disconnect us not only from our own communities, but also from other native communities around us. 
Um, I believe our, our workshops and National Breath of Life more broadly is really rooted in what I see as a really indigenous ethic of cross-cultural sharing and solidarity. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just really proud that our participants are able to get that sort of um, feeling and experience from our workshops, and I wanted to mention it. So you'll be hearing more about ILDA this afternoon from Drs. Costa and Lockwood, but I, I wanted to take a minute um, to depart because it's such a focus of what we do at our Module 2 workshop. So just want to give a quick overview. So as I've mentioned, ILDA stands for the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive. ILDA is a web-based tool built for digital archiving of a given language's archival materials, and it comes paired with a dictionary website and mobile app that can share data with the archive. And this creates a direct pathway from the archival materials to the various contexts of re revitalization, such as the home, community, classroom, et cetera. ILDA has support for written audio and video formats and is continuously being improved based off the needs of our user communities. ILDA is based off the Miami, Illinois Digital Archive or MIDA that was developed by the Miami Tribe and the Miamia Center and is now being shared through National Breath of Life. Um, I wanted to note that software like this is not easy or cheap to develop. And for a lot of communities, it's not realistic or feasible to build custom software tools like this for their efforts. I can't stress enough the level of generosity and care that the Miami Tribe um, and Miami, Miami Center and Miami University are displaying by sharing this tool and the approaches to archives-based revitalization developed through the Miami revitalization efforts. Making ILDA widely available to communities it, and both financially and institutionally supporting National Breath of Life is incredibly generous. And I consistently hear from our partner communities how grateful they are for your support. And I say this not only as a National Breath of Life employee, but as a person from a community that relies on and benefits from ILDA and the approaches we learned at National Breath of Life every day in our language revitalization. Um, ILDA is designed specifically to enable archives-based language revitalization. Um, that's really key that the software is de designed for rev uh, revitalization. Previous tools were designed for linguistic analysis or linguistic bilinguists for linguists, this is designed for natives by natives. And that means that the structure and functions of the software all point towards eventual return of language from the archive into community use. And we continually strive to keep the goal of community language use in mind whenever we're identifying changes or improvements to the software. I'll just show a couple of screenshots of ILDA. Um, while an ILDA archive can look fairly complex if you've ever logged on to your tribe's site. At its core, the software is doing several basic functions to make archival materials accessible for revitalization. And the first is really just making materials searchable. So once a user community has transcribed their materials, they upload those to ILDA and they're instantly searchable. There are layers of metadata and customization of the search that allow researchers to hone in on needed language to help them create materials for language revitalization. Alongside those transcriptions, users upload digital copies of the original manuscripts, audio files, or videos to be paired with each individual entry. And this ensures that researchers working within ILDA can quickly and easily reference original materials for context and to identify mistakes. For communities with more recent documentation where people have um, strong personal connections to the speakers who provided data, uh, it can really offer descendants the opportunity to engage with their, their relatives' words in a more intimate way. One aspect of working with multiple communities is that each brings with them needs and analysis of the software that can improve it for all the users. So when my team started using ILDA for our language, we needed audio functionality that wasn't in MIDA because a large portion of our materials are audio. So from our need, the Miami Center added the ability to upload and play audio within ILDA 
and several communities are using that feature. At the request of one of our recent Workshop 2 communities, we've recently added the ability to put video, um, which will benefit communities doing documentation today. But of course, a archival database is not necessarily the best tool to bring language to the wider community. Um, they can be slow to use in search and a little complicated. So ILDA is mostly used by linguists, teachers, and language researchers to analyze and find, create materials. But what is an effective tool for language vitalization is an online dictionary and mobile app. So ILDA comes paired with that. Um, the dictionary has the capability to share data with the archive. So dictionary managers can work with linguists to bring analyzed language over to be accessed by the community quickly and easily in language revitalization contexts. Um, I will leave it to David and uh, Hunter to cover more of ILDA, but wanted to just give a little overview since it's so important to what we're doing. Um, I want to return to the module two workshops for a minute. So after each of our workshops, we paid attention to communities' progress through informal conversations with them, and we also engaged in formal assessment. Um, and we identified several hurdle, hurdles that were standing in the way of communities getting archives up and running. So many of the people who come to our workshops are already working full-time jobs, often in language offices or as language teachers, and they don't have time to add this archival work on top of their work duties, despite recognizing how important it is. Many of these communities also lack funding um, to bring in help, new positions to do this work. And finally, we learned that this type of tech Technical training has a lot of small details that are easily in one ear and out the other if you're not continually doing the processes. So what we really identified is that we need to stay engaged with these communities and provide ongoing training and support to them while they establish usable archives and dictionaries and try to help facilitate a planning process for them um, and help them identify future funding opportunities to help them grow into the future. So with all this in mind, we designed the National Breath of Life Apprenticeship Program, which is starting currently through funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Through this program, 10 language communities will identify an apprentice or two apprentices to work with community mentors and National Breath of Life staff over a period of 12 to 24 months on various aspects of archive and or dictionary creation based on their community needs. Each apprentice will be paid um, to work with their mentors and us at National Breath of Life to develop work plans and goals for their time in the program and they'll rece receive ongoing support and training from me in archive and dictionary development. Each apprenticeship will look really differently based on the needs and the stage that their community is in. Some will really focus on the background um, typing up or transcription of archival materials, while others will work to create and record audio for online dictionaries. Um, we'll also support our apprentices in that planning process and hope by the end of it, we have solid midterm plans uh, with sources of funding identified that they can apply for. Um, the overarching goals of the apprenticeship program aim to address the limitations that we found in the module two workshops while still building on the strengths and relationships we have with our partner communities. So specifically, we plan to provide support to these communities to help them establish usable and useful archives and or dictionaries for language revitalization. Our hope is that our apprentices gain useful skills and knowledge, as well as integrate with their community's existing revitalization framework in ways that lead to this long-term engagement. And I, I do wanna note here that we do not envision our relationship with these communities ending after the apprenticeship program. Um, we are in a relationship building phase and we really see our work as relationship building. So we're committed to long-term relationships with endangered language communities, and we're gonna continue offering training and support to all the folks we work with. So far, we've identified six communities to participate in the program, and we're um, just getting them onboarded literally this week, next week. Um, 
and we're working to identify four more. And these communities were all selected due to long-standing relationships with us, their desire to use ILDA, their degree of readiness to engage in this type of work. So we're getting that started now. Um, gonna choose four more communities shortly um, and are really looking forward to that. So I know I'm out of time, so I'll uh, rush through our plans for the future. Um, we're really anticipating learning a lot from the apprenticeship program, self-paced program. It's, we hope to continue that into the future. Um, we're doing assessment work continually with everything we do so we can continue learning and growing. Um, and maybe we'll just end. I'll pass it to Gabriella for a few thank yous. Yes, I won't even touch anything and I'll stand on my tippy toes. <laughs> I just want to take a minute to um, acknowledge that the evolution and growth of the National Breath of Life uh, is the result of a large collaborative commitment, as you have seen, to support the efforts of Native American communities to revitalize their cultures and languages and for the well-being of their members. We're grateful to the Nation National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for innovating within their funding practices to support by way of the National Breath of Life the effort of dozens of communities working on the sustainability of 65 Native American awakening languages. The Miamia Center serves as the institutional home of the National Breath of Life. On the occasion of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the relationship between the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Miami University, we want to acknowledge that the institutional stability that the center derives from this partnership also lends stability to the National Breath of Life, thereby enabling us to engage with Native American communities with a confidence that we can maintain the commitment in the long term that uh, Jerome just mentioned. We wish to acknowledge as well the commitment of the very communities whose languages are being revitalized. The vision for the future they see for their communities and the commitment to make that future a reality is what energizes us and teaches us how best to think about the national breath of life so that it truly fulfills its mission to grow the forest around us. The relationships that we have built with these communities beautifully exemplifies the concept of nepuantenki, learning from each other. It is, through that, it is through what we learn about the community's hopes and needs, commitments and visions that we learn how best to strategize the evolution of the national breath of life. And quite importantly, both again, Jerome and I would like to express our deep gratitude to the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma for its leadership and for the generosity with which uh, you have embraced the national breath of life.